Good to see everyone this morning on this fine day. We continue to remember those that are in harm's way in that storm in your prayers also today as we go through that. A lot of people there are very uncertain this morning and our prayers go out to them. You know, keys are a big thing in life, not as big as they used to be because a lot of things have keyless ignition now, but keys are still a big thing in life. And, you know, the idea of a key carries authority, carries power. To have a key means you have you have the authority or you have the, the, uh, the uh, basically have the ability or have the trust to enter a place or to enter something or to get into something. And that's a big thing. And, and we guard our keys, don't we? Because our keys uh, protect our valuables, protect our home, protect our car. They protect other things, things we don't want people just to, to go into. So keys are a, are, a, are a big thing, and the idea of that power that comes with keys is, is a really big thing. A lot of times if you work someplace, they give you a key, and if you, and if you lose that job or quit that job, they want your keys back. They take that away from you, take that ability away from you to enter and leave as you please. But in the Bible, keys are the idea of the same idea, the idea of entering or opening up to something. And in Matthew chapter 16, all our texts in Matthew today, in Matthew chapter 16, you know, that was a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. Who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're a prophet, you know. Uh, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say, he said, but who do you say that I am? There's an important question here. He says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him in Matthew 16, 16. He said, Simon answered him. Uh-oh. Not going. Okay. Simon answered him, and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. You know, that's a lot of authority, isn't it, to give to to somebody. It's interesting because Jesus didn't give it to all the apostles, did he? He didn't, he didn't open it up to all of them. And I think that's really fascinating. It maybe shows a relationship between Peter and Christ and, and kind of gives you the idea of, of maybe what, what Jesus thought about Peter. What were the other apostles thinking when Jesus says, you're Peter, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom? And what exactly did that mean? You know, and he, he really put a lot of authority with that, didn't he? Whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose will be loosed. Really gave him a tremendous amount of authority with that statement. It's something that I've, I've thought about a lot, that idea and that statement. And why Peter and, 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 why, uh, and why Jesus did that in the way that he did. You know, I think, uh, who do you trust with keys? You know, if you got keys, who do you give them to? Who would you give them to? Your family, your your kids, maybe. Maybe some of your family you wouldn't give them to, right? I mean, who do you give your keys to? You know, it's a big thing when you do that. Who do you give the keys to your car to? First time you give your kids the keys to your car. That's a big thing, isn't it? Here's the keys to the car. That'll bring your prayer life to a whole new level right there. Let me tell you right now, right? Here's the keys to the car. Go and... Try not, to, try not to hurt yourself or somebody else, right? But it's a big thing when you give them that authority. When you give somebody the key to your house or your business, uh, an employee, the keys to your business, that's a big thing. You're giving them the ability to go into your possession, to go into your property and to do things there. There's people you wouldn't want to have keys, I would think, wouldn't you? People that you wouldn't want to have access to that. Otherwise, why would we lock it up? Right? Why would we lock it up? We didn't want people to have access. So, so, we, so I, I thought about that a lot. And I thought, and here's Peter. Here's Peter. You know, what's so special about him that God said, that God said, here, I'm going to give you this ability. Give it to you, Peter. Not to all the apostles, not to everybody else. But he said, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it to you. And I just always thought that was really kind of something that he would just give that to, to Peter. 
You know, in Matthew, he's the only one that really records this. In Matthew, he's the only place that we get Peter walking on the water. We, all, we know that story. You know, when I was thinking about the trust involved in that, I've preached sermons over this. We've all heard, probably read books on it. But you think about the trust involved in that passage. Peter saying, if it's you, Lord, command me to come out on the water. And I really think that's always fascinating that Peter, that Peter says that, number one. Command me to come out on the water. I'm like, why didn't he just go? Right? Why didn't Peter just, because you can't do that. That's why, because you can't, can't do that. Right? He needed some sort of permission, some sort of authority to say, step out of the water. And I've always wondered, why would Peter even want to do that? Why didn't he say, Jesus, if it's you, come over here a little closer so we can see you. Right? But Peter wanted to step out, and there's so much trust involved in that. And I've, and, and I can't, it wasn't there, and I can't imagine it, but I, I spent a lot of time on boats and a lot of time on water, and, and it just amazes me, you know, how scary water can be and how scary storms can be, and at night, and the, and the waves. And Jesus didn't calm the waves until Peter got out, and I think that's really significant in the story. You know, Peter wants to step out on that wave, and, I, and in my mind, of course, you all know I kind of think of things in weird ways, but in my mind, I always just kind of wondered how that happened. You know, was the waves, was Peter going like going up and down when the waves when he walked? Was he like on top? I just don't know these things, right? But I always wanted to know, right? But the thing of it is, he trusted Christ. If Jesus said, come to me, then it was okay. It was all right to do it. And I always thought that was just an amazing thing in the life of Peter. And it really gives an idea of that relationship that Peter and Jesus had with each other. They had a very unique relationship in the bible and, and we don't maybe talk about that as much it's kind of like with children where where you know jesus had these apostles and you're like well he loved all the apostles the same well maybe he did i mean i'm not saying he didn't but he definitely had a closer relationship with certain apostles and he definitely had the closest relationship with peter and it's that trust so Peter steps out, and then, you know, we know that story. Peter goes out, walks towards Jesus on the water, and then Peter begins to sink, and Jesus grabs a hold of him, right, and lifts him up. And what a, what a picture that is, right? In the middle of the water, and the storm raging, and the Peter sinking, and Jesus reaching out his hand, and, and then you see that trust of each other. Peter trusted Jesus. Well, he sank. People say, well, he he took his eyes off Jesus. We've all heard all the stories. But the primary focus of the story is Jesus. Peter trusted Jesus so much that he walked out on that water. You know, the other thing is, is that Jesus trusted Peter. You know, that went both ways in that relationship, didn't it? He trusted Peter to have the faith to do it. He trusted Peter to, to, to be that person. And I, and I think that shows that relationship of, that he had with him and that Peter wasn't perfect. You know, and I, I think that's a, what I really see in this whole lesson is that, and what I think I want to get to in the end is that Peter wasn't a perfect guy. You know, we always hold Peter up. Peter's the chief apostle and, and Peter this and Peter that, you know. And, and the truth is Peter wasn't perfect. And even Paul says, I stand and condemned him to his face, right? Even Paul at one point condemned Peter because he associated with the Jews and not the Gentiles. You know, Peter was far from a perfect person. But that relationship that Jesus had with Peter wasn't based upon Peter's perfection. It was based upon Peter's heart. You know, what kind of heart did Peter have? He had the heart that said, I want to step out on that water. I want to go to you on that water. And, and nobody else had that heart. Nobody else had that thought or had that idea but Peter. And so you kind of get this idea of, of that relationship uh, that he had. And so why would you want to give the keys to Peter? Because of this relationship, this trust that they had with each other. This trust that had developed between them. You know, who would you want to give the keys to? You'd want to give them to the one who protects you, who protects your stuff. Isn't that true? You know, you, do, you wouldn't want to give your keys to your house to somebody who would go in and tear it up, or keys to the car to somebody who would, who would go and race it down the street. 
I might do that, because, you know, because that, but, but anyway. But you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to give that to that type of person. You want to give it to a person who protects your stuff, who takes care of it, right? Who brings it back to you better than they took it away from you. That's the kind of person you want, you want to do that. Somebody that has your interests at heart. Not their interests at heart, but your interests at heart. And you know what? Peter really demonstrates that. And once again, we look at Matthew when Jesus is talking about, I'm going to die and be raised on the third day. And Peter, and Peter took Jesus aside. You ever really notice that in that passage? You know, they're all there. They're all together. And, and, P, and Jesus is saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised. And then Peter, he takes Jesus aside. And I think that speaks, once again, it speaks to that relationship they had. He takes Jesus aside and he says, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Why didn't he say it in front of everybody else? Why didn't he say it in front of all the, why did he take Jesus, why is that important? Why is that important in the story that he pulled Jesus off to the side? And the reason it's important is because that's the relationship that he had with Jesus. That he could pull the king, the creator of the universe, his, his savior, his king, his lord, could take him to the side and tell him what he really thought. Say, this can never happen to you. And he turned and said to Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block for me, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And we always get hung up on that part of the passage. But the thing of it is, Peter wasn't really trying to hinder Christ. He cared for Christ. It'd be like somebody coming to you and saying, well, you know, I've got a terminal illness that I'm going to die. And you would say, oh, no, don't ever let that happen to you. I would never have let that happen to you. Or somebody saying they're in danger and you saying, I will protect you. That's what Peter was doing. Peter didn't understand God's will. Peter understood that he cared for Christ and he, and he didn't want that to happen to him. You know, that shows that relationship, that protection that trust that that they had for one another and and it shows you that that peter cared maybe more about the lord at that minute than about what god's ultimate plan was because that's the love that he had that's the love that he had for him that's a really deep love that's the kind of people you want to give keys to people who want to protect you people who want to protect what you have to to shield you from things that are that are that are wrong you know and if you ever give somebody the keys to your house and you're just not there right you just say here's the keys to my house you know that's a really big thing isn't it because when you let somebody into your home they kind of figure out who you are right they know kind of what you eat what you wear what you what you listen to what you read they kind of get an idea of the kind of person you are whether you're a neat person or a not neat person or whatever kind of person, it's a big thing, isn't it? You know, when people come to your home, if you don't know them, and, and you're like most people that I know, you're straightening that house up and getting it all ready. You want it to look the best it can look, don't you? You, you want that, you want their image of you to be based on that. But is that really who you are, right? Now, if you show up at my house and Un unannounced and just knock on my door you know i'm gonna let you right in my house but i'm gonna be honest with you it might not be the neatest or the tidiest house you're used to or whatever but i guarantee you one thing we'll sit down and talk have a glass of iced tea or something right and it'll all be all right but you know you'll know me for what it is right but not for what i want you to see and that's really interesting in life the trust that we have somebody who really really knows you because i'm telling you one of the things we tell ourselves is if people really knew me right if people really knew me they wouldn't like me am i right isn't that why we try to make things look better sometimes or make it look really good because we want people to have that impression but the people we really want to have the keys to our house is the people who really know us, isn't it? The people who have a relationship with us, that know that everything's not always in place, and know my whatever, you know? They know, and it's okay. They really know me. And in Matthew 17, it says, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them high upon the inner circle, we call them, Peter, James, and John. 
And you know, it's interesting, this is one case. The time when Jesus raised from the dead, that was another case when he just took them with him. And there, if those two are mentioned in the Bible, how many other times in the life of Jesus did Jesus say, Peter, James, and John, you guys come with me? Right? I mean, those can't be the only two times. So how many other times were the other apostles sitting there like, well, what are we supposed to do? Right? You know, here Jesus took off with these three again, his favorites. The favorites, right? Those are the favorites. You know, he takes off with these three. So how many times did Jesus do that same thing with them? He took off with them, and they knew him better than anybody else. They, they, who did he take with him when he was alone in the garden and when he, was, when he was crying and calling out to God and sweat like drops of blood falling from him? And he was, he was calling out to the Lord. Who did he take? Those guys. Why? Because they knew him. They knew the physical human side of Jesus. They knew his fears. They knew his concerns. They knew his sadness. They knew his sorrow. They knew who he really, really was. And it was okay. So when he told Peter, he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. He was giving it to somebody who really intimately knew exactly who Jesus was. He was trusting him with something that was precious. Isn't that what you do when you give somebody the keys to your house or whatever? You're trusting them with something that's precious to you. Who do you want to trust that to? Somebody who knows you. Somebody who trusts you. Somebody who wants to protect you. Somebody who cares about you. And all those things were demonstrated in Peter. But more than anything, you want to give them to someone who loves you. You know, love is such a word, we throw it out all the time, don't we? We hear it every day. I love this. I love that. I love you. How many people in your life really love you? I mean, they don't just tell you they love you. How many people in your life really, really love you? Have you ever gone through a day of your life, and at the end of the day, after everybody goes on, everybody calls you, and at the end of the day, you sit down and you think, the only people who really love me are the people who want something out of me. Did you ever tell yourself that? The only people that really love me are the people who want something. Because every phone call I got all day, it was somebody wanting something, right? Nobody just called me to say, how you doing? I don't know where Jim Broadbent is today. He's here. But Jim, every time I do this sermon, Jim will call me this week. He'll call me this week. I don't know where Jim is. He'll call me this week and he'll say, how you doing? I just called to see how you were doing. Right? <laughs> you know? so, but, but, you know, how many people really just call you, you know, to see how you're doing, to check on you for your welfare? Right? How many people call you in the day to see what they can do for you? Not what you can do for them. Right? Who are true friends? Who are people that really love you? How do you know somebody loves you? How do you know somebody loves you? By what they do for you. Right? Am I right? Isn't that how you really know? That's how you know people love you. By their actions. By, by what they do. And Peter says to him, and of course you know this isn't going to happen. The way Peter thinks in Matthew 26. But Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Listen to what it says after that. All the disciples said the same thing too. Of course, they're all going to do it, right? But the truth is, they loved him enough that they were willing, at that point in their mind, they were willing to die. They were willing to die for him. You know, when Jesus, after his resurrection, he was sitting on the, and he went to the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, I think it says in Scripture, same place. And he was sitting there and he's having and he made breakfast for them. They were out catching fish. And you remember that story? And it was Simon, wasn't it? And he says, do you love me? Right? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Do something for me. You know, Peter, of all those apostles, it was Peter in that, in that meal that Jesus looked at. Peter. And he says, do you love me? Because I've given you the keys 
to the kingdom of heaven. You need to be focused on not you. Not, not fishing. Not doing these things for you. You need to be focused on what I need you to be focused on. And, and I think Peter, of all people, Peter was grieved. Why do you ask me if, if I love you? Why do you ask me that again? Don't you know that I love you? Haven't I told you I loved you? And Jesus says, you got to show me you love me. You know, how do we know people really love us when they show us they love us? And Peter, he did love the Lord. You know, after that denial and those three times that Peter denied the Lord and those three times that he, that he, he said, I don't know Him. And I'm sure that three-time number that he said I didn't know him is directly related to those three times that Jesus says, do you love me? I'm sure there's a relationship there. But even in those three times, Peter was weeping, wasn't he? He was grieved. He couldn't believe what he was saying. He couldn't believe that he denied, that he denied Christ. He said, I would die with you. And then, and then he denies him. And, and, and he's the one that Jesus entrusted the keys of the kingdom to. And yet he's not even standing up and admitting that, that, that he knows that he knows Jesus. And once again, it just shows you the humanity of Peter. That he wasn't perfect. And Jesus wasn't looking for a perfect person to, to open the kingdom. Think about that for a minute. Jesus wasn't looking for a perfect person to open the kingdom of God. He was looking for the right person. And the right person in God's eyes isn't the perfect person. Never has been. It's the person that God changes their heart to make them who God wants them to be. You know, so many times we think we're so broken that God can't use us. We think that we're so flawed that we can't be effective in God's kingdom. But God tells us exactly the opposite thing. He says, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's exactly what I'm going to use. And when Peter denies the Lord, and, and he remembers it, and if you look at that Matthew 26, it says, Peter, remember the word which Jesus had said, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. You know why Jesus chose Peter? Because Peter had a tender heart. Peter had a repentant heart. Peter went out and weeps bitterly, wept bitterly. What's the difference in Peter and Judas? Could Judas not have come back? Could Judas not have been saved? Was Judas unsavable? Not according to the Bible. The Bible says we all can repent and return. The difference between Judas and Peter was their heart. Their heart. Peter turned back to the Lord. Peter wept bitterly. Peter, Peter cried. Brethren, who are we this morning? You know, who are we really this morning? Are we perfect people? Are we broken people? Are we flawed people? I guarantee you we're not perfect. No, I'm not. You know, the truth is, when it comes to the way God looks at you and me this morning, brethren, we're Peter. We are Peter, aren't we? I am. I'm Peter. I know that. I'm the guy who I get a great burst of spirituality and a great burst of God, and I want to go do great big things. And sometimes those things don't work out, and I think, I mean, that's me. I'm that guy. I'm the guy that stands up one minute and is bold and I'm going to do whatever, I'm going to do this. And then I'm the guy that maybe doesn't do it. And I'm the guy that weeps because I didn't stand up and do those things that I should have done. I'm the guy that's denied Jesus at times in my life. I can stand in this congregation and stand in front of you and I can admit that to you. I'm the guy who's denied Christ. Not that I ever denied he was the son of God or denied who he was, but I'm the guy who didn't speak up when I should have spoke up. I'm the guy who's, who had opportunity to tell people about Jesus Christ and the gospel, and I'm the guy who didn't open his mouth. 
That's, that's Rex. Now, I'm not going to say I haven't at times opened my mouth, but I'm going to tell you I'm the guy who oftentimes, sometimes, certainly, did not speak up and defend my Lord and spoke about my Lord when I should have. I'm the guy who was silent because I was afraid of what people would say or what people would do or what people would think of me or what that would do to my relationship with a person. I've been quiet at times when I should have opened my mouth. Yes, I'm Peter. Are you? I'm the guy that has to be brought back in line sometimes. That's me. I'm Peter. But you know, I know something else. I'm Peter in here too. I'm the one who loves my Lord. I'm the one who would say, I, I, would, I would gladly tell you right now I would die for the sake of Christ. But I'm also Peter. I never have been put that to the test either. I've never been tested. Right? And maybe when I'm tested, maybe I would fail. Like Peter failed. But I have the heart of Peter that I know I would come back and I would weep over that and I would come back to the Lord. I think the reason that God chose Peter is because we're all kind of Peter. We all have our flaws, our imperfections. We all have not probably spoken up about Jesus when we should have. We probably have all maybe said things that we were going to do and had great intentions and we've lost and that hasn't worked out for us. We've, we've all been there. We've all been Peter. And yet God chose Peter not because of Peter's faults, not because of his failings, not because of the problems that he had, but God chose Peter because of Peter's heart because he knew in the end Peter's heart would prevail. And Peter's heart did prevail in the end. Peter was crucified in Rome upside down because he didn't want to be crucified like his Lord. Peter prevailed. God knew the heart of Peter, and God knows the heart of you, and God knows the heart of Rex, and God knows that I'm not where I need to be all the time. God knows that I'm not always perfect. God knows I'm not always a Christian that I want to be, but God knows my heart. God knows that's what I'm striving to be, and that's what I want to be, and I'm going to finish strong. You know, because in Christianity, in your relationship with Christ, I want to tell you something. We talk a whole lot about the start, don't we? We talk about a whole lot about being saved. We talk a whole lot about getting baptized. We talk a whole lot about the start. But I want to promise you something. With Christ, if you don't end well, I don't care how you started. If you don't end well, it doesn't matter how you started. That kind of gives me a chill. I kind of had a goosebump thing went down my leg right there when I said that. That kind of gave me a chill, right? Because it doesn't matter. It matters how you end. It matters your heart. It matters your stay to it, that you're going to stay with it, that you're going to do those things. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that, is that God has given us the keys of this kingdom because we're Peter. He's entrusted us with it. You know, God told Peter, he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the most precious thing on earth, the keys of the kingdom of God. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up before all those Jews and he unlocks, he unlocks the gospel for the Jews, doesn't he? He unlocks it. And years later, when it comes to Cornelius, and, and the Lord comes to the household of Cornelius, who does God call to go to Cornelius? Peter. Right? Because Peter got the keys in Matthew 16. And Peter goes to the household of Cornelius and he takes those keys and he unlocks the most precious thing on earth to the Gentiles. But I'm going to tell you again, God didn't give Peter the keys because Peter was perfect. God gave Peter the keys because Peter had the heart of Christ. And brethren, He's given you and me those keys because we have that heart within us. He's given us the keys to open the gospel to the world, to open the gospel to the people around us. And we're going to be like Peter. And at times we're going to fail and we're not going to speak up when we should. But if we keep striving to do that, if striving to be who Christ wants us to be, I promise you He's going to use us to unlock the kingdom to somebody in our lives. Brethren, He's entrusted you with the most precious thing. He's given you the key to the house. He's given you the key to heaven. So you can open it up for everybody that's around you. 
You know, and if Peter could do that, as flawed as Peter was, if Peter can do that, then Rex can do it. And you can do it. And I just think it's just a powerful message for us. Because I want to be that person that not only goes to heaven, I want to be that person that takes as many people with me as I can. I want to be that person that opens the gospel to people around me. Don't you? Don't you want to be that person? I hope you do. Because I promise you, right here, right here, God gave you the key to the kingdom. Right here. And all you got to do is open it up and unlock it and share it with the people around you. Man. Blessed are you. For flesh and blood do not reveal this to you, but my Father is in heaven. Who do you say I am, Peter? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you. For flesh and blood do not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Brethren, every time we stand up in our lives and say Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we're unlocking the kingdom. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Who is Jesus Christ? Son of the living God. And every time we profess that with our mouth and others, we're taking that key and we're unlocking the kingdom to another soul. You have it. All you got to do is open it. Right? And that's all we need to do in our lives. Thanks for your time this morning, for your attention. If there's any way that we can assist you this morning, if you need the prayers of this congregation, if we need to study with you, if we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand and sing.